Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The Old Testament tabernacle, Holy of Holies, Mercy Seat, and all the priestly work of atonement were all shadows of things to come. We read here in Hebrews 10, verse 1, read along with me. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. All the slain animals that had to be sacrificed for the sin offering and the trespass offering, but for the sin offering, had to happen year in, year out, for hundreds and hundreds of years. For then, verse 2, would they have not ceased to be offered? You're asking the question there. For then, would they have not ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is remembrance again made of sins every year. Every year. But that changed when Jesus came and he died and his blood was spilled. The high priest would sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood of the slain animals for the sin offering, year in and year out. And the Old Testament tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, and everything along with it was just a shadow of things to come. See, the blood of Jesus had to be applied to the heavenly mercy seat. That's right, a heavenly mercy seat. What you see here is just a earth copy. We just call it that. Of what's up in the heavens, in the throne of God. Or near the throne of God. And Jesus' blood had to be applied to that heavenly mercy seat. To redeem mankind. If for some reason Jesus' blood all dripped out and soaked into the ground at Calvary, then the sins of humanity could not have been taken away. That's right. You heard me correctly even though some very popular people preached, preach and still preach the sins were taken away by the death of Jesus Christ and they leave out the blood and I'll get to that in a minute you go to Hebrews 9 verse 12 I believe it is yes neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered, entered in once into the holy place. What holy place? The holy place, the holy of holies into the temple? At Jerusalem in his time? No. That heavenly location where the mercy seat is at. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. I preached the message on it, but now I'm going to peel another layer, or at least some of the layer off of what I already preached on concerning the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have a message that's labeled, It is finished. And that is accurate. It was finished. But it wasn't finished if you peel another la layer off the onion, so to speak, or dig into God's Word a little further, 
and bringing the Old and New Testament together and understanding then that there was something else besides what was finished at the cross. Oh, and I bet you I have so many Christians right now probably throwing stones at me right now, throwing stones at the computer or whatever you're listening on and watching on. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Of course it was finished at the cross. No, it wasn't. And hear me out. See, the blood had to be applied on the heavenly mercy seat. This is not some new strange doctrine I'm preaching. This is in the Word of God. The problem is, and the sad truth is, that too many people attend lousy churches. Their entire life, and have never been blessed with the truth of the Word of God. They, don't, they never come to the understanding of this fact. I guarantee you this Easter, I have no problem anyone saying it is finished. And I, like I said, I preached message, message or two, one or two of them, I don't remember now. I think they're both labeled it is finished. And to a certain extent, that is correct. But this is one preacher that realized that it wasn't completely finished. It was finished on this realm, or in this realm, on earth. What Jesus had to do, had to accomplish, what he had victory over on this realm, on this earth. Far as that's concerned, yes, you can say that was finished. Or you can say it is finished. But when you put the total package together, what God's word said had to be accomplished, no, then it was not completely finished. Why? Because it had to, Jesus had to present his blood at the, earth, at the heavenly mercy seat. See, in the Old Testament, a lamb's death wasn't good enough. Let's go to Exodus real quick. Chapter 12. Verse 13. Most of you know the story. If you don't, then I would suggest you read the whole chapter, starting with verse 1. And the blood from the slain lamb, by the way, shall be to you for a token or a mark upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be unto, upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Earlier in that same chapter, and they shall take, verse 7, of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and in the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And it gives further instruction. They had to locate a lamb without blemish, a male of the first year. And they shall keep it for a certain amount of time. And then when it came time, they had to slain it. As, well, compare this with some preachers, popular preachers, by the way, national, international popularity, is huge. And they preached that the death was sufficient. Well, if this was a type what it would have to happen in the New Testament, where Jesus, about 1,400 years later, would come as a type now, the real, not as a type now, but the real thing, you would figure the same thing had to happen again. See, Jesus' death was not just sufficient enough. His blood, his own blood, by him, needed to be applied. To what? Nothing down here. 
Because there's no record of it after his death and resurrection of anything except the occasional meetings that he had with his disciples and a few others. And then he just sailed off in the blue. So where was his blood applied? In the heavenly mercy seat. The heavenly mercy seat. But in verse 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Century after century, for millennium, the Old Testament saints look for that precious Lamb of God, their Messiah. Luke 2. Jump around your, your Bible tonight. Be ready. You always should be ready. You can't keep up right notes. Luke 2. Verse 23, they were looking for their Messiah because in verse 23 in Luke chapter 2, it says, As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy, holy to the Lord. Every pregnant woman was hoping that their child would be the promised Messiah. No exception. No exception. And he did come, just as was promised many times over in the Old Testament. The literal blood, folks, had to be applied to the mercy seat in heaven. Now I want to read you something. The blood was to be sprinkled. Remember? Going back to the Old Testament, I haven't really talked much on the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies, even the mercy seat or, or, or any of those furnishings that you find in the tabernacle. I will get to that probably in this communion series. The blood was to be sprinkled. Remember, on the, mer remember the mercy seat? Remember on the mercy seat right after the death is substitutionary animal or sacrifice. Now Christ is, of course, our substitute. I don't think anybody really has that prob problem of understanding that. He was slain for us upon the cross and entered into the death for us. And when he arose, he immediately went to heaven, entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven, sprinkled his precious blood upon the mercy seat before the throne of God and forever settled the sin questions and delivered us from the curse of the law. This is clearly taught in the New Testament. That's right. Because we, we, we read it already in Hebrews 9. 12, you go back to it. You can never say it enough or read it enough. What, how's it read? But by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. See, the Bible makes it plain when he accomplished this. I want to continue reading. What happened on the morning of the resurrection? He meets Mary at the tomb. As soon as Mary recognized him, she prostrated herself upon him and would have kissed his feet. But with shocking suddenness, Jesus emphatically says to her, Touch me not. And then he proceeds immediately to give the reason why Mary is not permitted to touch him at all. You want to read it. Let's just go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Like I said, if you can't keep up, take notes. When this comes back in the archives, you can follow it. Chapter 20, verse 17. Here it says, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Literally, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Touch me not, for I now am ascended, about to ascend, upon, about to ascend upon, unto my Father. We can understand this action when we remember that the high priest, after he offered the sacrifice, 
was to enter the Holy of Holies before he did anything else. After he, the sacrifices was, sacrifice was completed, he was entered the Holy of Holies before he did anything else in the Old Testament. Before he did anything else with that precious blood of that slain animal, no one was allowed to approach him. Everyone was shut out till it was completely done. And here you have a record of the meeting with Mary. We have the fulfillment of this type once again. Here Mary meets her great high priest, our great high priest, who, by the way, just arisen from the tomb, from the physical dead. But before he enters the Holy of Holies with his precious reconciling blood, he says to her, touch me not, touch me not. The Bible makes it clear, folks. Man and their doctrines what confuses the matter. It's beautiful and wonderful the way it's written to be understood. I've said many times over, use the unverifiable, I mean, the verifiable, not unverifiable, the verifiable word of God. The best way to interpret the Bible is not to interpret it at times and bring any more confusing doctrine into it, but let it verify itself over and over again. I've said that for many years now. You can do that by cross-referring scripture and not twisting it while you're doing that to form a complete an accurate picture of what God's Word says, which is the truth. Now, let me just throw something in there. Those of you who rely on your Greek dictionaries and lexicons like it's a Bible, some of your lexicons will state that, well, this should be translated, do not continue touching me. See how they can screw things up, folks? And how they twist the Word of God? I have written down here so I wouldn't forget. Because if you get this wrong, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the topic of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's like getting your car and you think you're Heading, you're going cross country, but you think you're heading in the right direction, but you really don't realize you're going in the opposite way. You have to get this right. This is something you just can't get close. You have to get it right. As I said before, some people wonder, I'll pre preach more salvation message. Every communion message is a salvation message. You have to have eyes to see and ears to hear, I guess. It should be translated, do not keep touching me. Some suggest that Mary was attempting to show Christ that she desired for him to remain in the world and not go to his father. Of course, there's all kinds of reasoning behind why they define what happened in those days and using the language they're trying to define it in as their reason why their translation or their definition is the accurate one. I'm sorry, you're missing a very important element. If this, what the high priest did in the Old Testament was a type of what was, and shadows of what was still yet to come, which Jesus would fulfill, then sorry. I think emphatically he says, when Mary tried to touch him, and why wouldn't she try to touch him? What she was seeing was a, a remarkable. He emphatically said, don't touch me. And then he gives the reason why. Then he gives the reason why. Let me continue reading what I was reading because I got a little bit sidetracked there, but that was good that I did. 
When the Lord was going to pass over Egypt and destroy the firstborn, he said to Moses and Aaron in Exodus 12, 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you, destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt, which we already read. The death of the lamb wasn't enough. According to some popular preachers, I can't get off that for some reason. I mean, the death of the lamb, excuse me, was enough, according to some popular preachers. One out here in the valley of Los Angeles. I'll just give it you his initials. J.M. Another one is R.T., another international famous preacher and pastor. They claimed the death of the lamb was enough. I'm sorry, it wasn't. See, God, in the Old Testament, or in the New, wasn't looking for a dead lamb in the, the backyard somewhere. God was looking for the blood that would be applied on the doorpost, on the door plate above the door in the Old Testament. And if it wasn't applied, death would come to the firstborn. The blood had to be applied. These ministries that preach differently are flawed. And if you don't get this right, everything else you do is flawed. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Well, they do some other things that are okay. You don't get this right about the blood. Forget being a Christian. That might sound harsh to you. But that is God-given truth in his word. Not Joe Quartz. God-given truth. This is the most important Christian doctrine that you have to get it right. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once to the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's Hebrews 9, 12. We don't hear enough these days about the precious blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from us from all sin. What a wonderful Savior, and I agree. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. Because we owe a debt we could not pay. Our sins had to be paid for with for our sins had to be paid for with Jesus' blood. In the Old Testament, the people's sins were only atoned, really only covered. Only covered. For in Leviticus 17, 11, it states, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul. The scripture speaks of the blood of animals, which were sacrificed to temporarily cover the sins of the people in the Old Testament, until the Messiah would come and offer the perfect sacrifice of himself to God the Father. We read in Hebrews 9, 12 concerning Jesus, I'll read it again. I can't read it enough. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus' blood didn't atone for our sins, but rather took them away forever. That's why you see the word atonement a lot being used in the New Testament in pulpits today. And that's fine, but that's not complete. I'm sorry, it's not. I don't care how you were taught. I don't care how smart the person was in your eyes. It has to live up to this, what's being said. Or it's either incomplete or flawed. 
Jesus' blood didn't atone our sins. Yes, it covered our sins. But the, can, let me see what kind of illustration can I use. This is kind of crude. But for lack of a better illustration right now, you ever see a, a magician on stage? And he has this handkerchief or a piece of linen cloth. And he shows you, what, say, this bottle of water. He's going to tell you he's going to make it disappear right in front of your eyes. And he has this linen cloth. He says he's going to put this linen cloth over this object, in this case a water bottle. And when he lifts the cloth, the water bottle is going to be gone. Out of sight. No one can find it. Gone forever. And of course, the magic act, usually he brings it back. But that's not what Christ did. He just didn't cover our sin. Using that illustration, he made our sins disappear. Gone forever. Gone forever. And that's why so many denominations are flawed on this subject matter. Maybe I'll teach one, teach it a, uh, a couple of pro, uh, service programs on their flawed doctrine. The Seventh Day of Venice comes to mind, for instance. Flawed. I don't want to get sidetracked by that, so. He took our sins away forever. Not just covered them. He covered them and they disappeared. Gone. That's why we can, be, we can sell back to the Father. Because they're gone. God can't even find them. And he's God. Jesus' blood didn't atone for our sins, but rather took them away forever. In the Old Testament, all they can do is have their sins. All the high priest do when he sprinkled the blood was atone the sins for that year. Christ did it once forever. Forever. There is damnable heresy circulating in many of our churches today, popularized by famous religious creatures across this nation and other nations. They teach that Jesus' liquid blood has no value or significance in and of itself. They claim that Jesus' blood is important only in the sense that it represents the death of Christ. Like I said, you don't get this right. You're in a heap of trouble. Nothing can be further from the truth, and I agree. When God told Moses to warn the Israelites concerning the coming tenth plague, which, by the way, was the death of the firstborn, the people were instructed to kill a lamb and then apply the lamb's blood to the side and upper doorposts of the home. Apply the blood. Hello, famous preachers and pastors. Not just the death of the lamb, but the blood that was spilled from that lamb at death had to be applied you couldn't go about this half-hearted and the blood should be a token for a, for a token or a mark upon the houses where ye are and when i see the blood i will pass over and the plague should not be upon you to destroy you when i smite the land of egypt are you hearing what's being said over and over when i see the blood 
when God sees the blood, he will pass over. There is not a second, even though God probably has his own timepiece. But for our understanding, there is not a second on the stopwatch or the, the clock or the whatever God's timepiece is that goes by that he does not see that blood on the mercy seat. Whose blood? Jesus Christ. Not any earthly mercy seat. Who cares if you find the ark and have cut it down here? Who cares? The one in heaven, in the heavenly places, even, it might even be the one that was here at one time. No, we'll never know for sure. Christ's blood's on it. God wasn't looking for a dead lamb when he sent that death angel in the Old Testament. In Egypt, looking for the blood, and the blood that was applied. You know, for these preachers that can't get it right, be forewarned. Be forewarned, because thus saith the word of the Lord, Hebrews, go with me quickly. Chapter 10. Verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be taught worthy who hath throtten underfoot who? The Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Let's read that again. Let it sink in. Especially you preachers that preach differently than what the God's Word says. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath throttled under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he has, was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite of the spirit of grace. Be forewarned. It's not something to mess around with. You don't have an option. Preacher or a listener out there tonight, including myself that's preaching it, we have to get this right. There's too much at stake. There is an eternity at stake. I pray daily. I might be off on some topics. God forbid. But just in case I am, please, Lord, never, let never happen that I preach. differently what your word says about your precious blood because I know I have to get this right there is no plan B let's continue Hebrews 9 Verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place, year, holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus' blood applied to the mercy seat in heaven is all sufficient. Jesus only needed to offer himself his sacrificed self once, folks. 
that's what's wrong with the Catholic religion and the Catholic crucifix. People admire the beauty of their churches. And I used to many years ago too. I can't even hardly go into one. Because when I go into one, I see a Jesus on a cross. The Catholics keep, keep him on a cross. And if I offend some of you Catholics, sorry. Don't you believe in a resurrection? Or you just stop it at the death, like some of these popular preachers today. In the Catholic Mass, I was grown up as a Catholic. We actually were taught to believe that digesting the, the wafer was a literal body and the, well, the wafer was a literal body and the blood of Jesus Christ each time. They call it transubstantiation, and I'll probably teach on that one time or another. You can't find that in Scripture. It's unscriptural. Unscriptural. Like I said, Jesus is not hanging on there that any longer. He's not on that cross any longer. And they make Jesus look decrepit and sickly. Yes, he was bruised, he was marred beyond recognition. I believe was a strong man. Not some looking, not some wimpy looking sissy. Boy, have the religions of this world created some strange ideas about Jesus Christ. Let me continue on this. Jesus died on the cross, was buried to confirm his death and then rose victoriously three days later. Christ is alive. Thank the Lord for his mercy, for paying for our many sins with his precious blood. Absolutely. From the blood of Abel's slain lamb in Genesis to the robes of the saints washed in the blood of the lamb revelation, the word of God centers around the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's a bloody book. Hebrews 9, 22, without shedding the blood, there is no remission. Jesus' death was just as important as his blood sacrifice and equally important the burial and resurrection, but everything concerning the events of Jesus' life were leading up to the blood being applied to the mercy seat in heaven. Jesus took his shed blood to heaven to present it to the Father by applying it to the mercy seat. This is why Jesus said to Mary in John 20, 17, Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. The blood couldn't be tainted. It's just not preachers, by the way. They get it wrong. It's actual Bibles, or supposedly the Holy Bible, the Word of God. I know that King James is hard to read, but it's still the best translation you can find in our English language. I have some examples here written down. Everybody's heard of the NIV translation. Another product that could probably trace back all the Westcott and Hort. Which I preached about in the past. I don't know what messages. If, I don't even know if it's in the archives or not. But I preach about those two individuals, how they changed the course of how Scripture would be understood. And it's so subtle, but yet so important what they did and what's been done ever since. It 
since we're still speaking about this touch me not verse how do they state it this is from the NIV Jesus said do not hold on to me you see what I'm saying folks did you catch it did you catch it already not as a King James says don't touch me do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father remember the King James said let's go back to it Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. You get this wrong. You might as well forget the rest of the translation if you're reading from the NIV. And I can list you a few others too, but I won't do it tonight. It's not worth the paper it's written on. We've covered that Jesus needed to apply his blood in heaven, just as the Old Testament priest, high priest, did year after year in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. See, if Mary had touched Jesus, she would have corrupted the blood. The NIV is wrong. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like Jesus couldn't ascend to heaven because Mary was hanging on to him. Think how silly that is. Just on the surface, using common sense. That's not what John 20, 17 means. Jesus had risen from the dead and he needed to appear before the Father in heaven, just like Hebrews 9, 24 teaches. And Jesus needed to apply his blood in the holy place as Hebrews 9, 12 states. So let these modern translations or these modern prophets of God minimize the importance of Jesus' blood because that's what they've done. That's what they've done. There could be no forgiveness of sins if it was if if there wasn't if there weren't if it weren't for Christ, excuse me, blood sacrifice. If you use the NIV from this point on, you have to be, you have to be spiritual, a spiritual moron because they get it wrong so many different ways but if they got it wrong on this important topic I don't need anything else to convince me find another translation just another warning for the people that are using the NIV I think I covered enough tonight to give you food for thought. To bring you the understanding that Jesus had to apply the blood just as he applied the blood in the Old Testament. So the death angel would pass over their household. Well, Jesus had to apply his blood in the mercy seat of heaven So the eternal death angel passes over us. Colossians 1.14. This is our hope. And this is what we faith and trust in. This is what we thank Christ for. In whom we have redemption. In whom we have redemption through his blood. 
even the forgiveness of sins. Even the forgiveness of sins. What a wonderful Savior we serve. How lucky. And lucky does not even describe it. It's like the word love I was, I was teaching on last Sunday night. I don't care who you are, including myself, will never completely comprehend what Jesus Christ gave up. I don't care if you're the richest person in the world, you lost everything. I don't care if you're Job in the Old Testament, if you lost everything. It does not even compare what Jesus, if you're just thinking on that terms alone, gave up. We'll never have a complete understanding of what that word love means. We'll just get a glimpse of it. And the rest of that mystery will be hopefully explained over there, where I believe it will. When we, re when we will be revealed all the true nature of love and all the meaning behind it. But we have enough to go on now to learn and grow by. Thank you, Jesus, is all I can end this with tonight for paying the price that I owe and making that full trip. It just not was finished what you did at the cross in this earth realm, even though that was finished. But you made sure you completed the job all the way into the heavenlies. And you applied your blood on that heavenly mercy seat for my benefit, for your benefit, for all who would trust and faith in him. We sure, surely can be thankful. Beyond what words can express for what he's done for us. That's what kind of Savior I serve. And that's the kind of Savior that I will continue to remember to my last breath in this body. And he wants me to remember him. He wants you to remember him. As often as you eat and drink, don't let a day go by without remembering our precious Savior that spilled his precious blood, that presented his body in this flesh with sinless blood and was slain for sinners like us. Thank you, Jesus, for making that trip and finishing it. Take the elements. Play the song.